Welcome to the Thomistic Institute podcast. Our mission is to promote the Catholic intellectual tradition in the university, the church, and the wider public square. The lectures on this podcast are organized by university students at Thomistic Institute chapters around the world. To learn more and to attend these events, visit us at ThomisticInstitute.org. It's really a pleasure to be giving a TI talk. I used to do that all the time, but it's been a hot minute. So yeah, I'm excited. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the medieval scholastic theologian Thomas Aquinas and what he thinks about sin. Now, for Thomas, in order to understand sin, or really in order to understand anything, you have to go back to basic first principles. So we'll start there. And the place that we have to start for sin is evil, right? So Aquinas has to contemporary ears a strangely capacious sense of evil, Right? When we hear evil, we think of something really bad, a plague, a genocide, torture. Aquinas is a bit more relaxed about evil. Evil for him is any privation or lack of good that would be appropriate to some being, right? Any lack. So evil can be minor, right? If a bad oyster causes stomach grief for a retired Nazi hiding out in Argentina, or if a magnolia flower on my tree in the front yard fails to bloom, these are going to be evils for Thomas Aquinas. The second thing to say is that evil is derivative, both ontologically and epistemically. So evil's a lack or an absence, but it's a lack or an absence of some form, due order, or measure. So we cannot really understand this view of evil as privation until we say something about form in the thought of Thomas Aquinas. So for Aquinas, being doesn't have a single account, definition, or nature. There is no sense to be made of just being as such for Aquinas. The primary sense of being for him is a substance. A substance is something like you or your dog or your houseplant. Substances exist through themselves, right? Whereas other modes of being only exist in substances. So think about things like place or quality or quantity, relation, and so on. These are things that exist in a substance. Now, the primary sense of being, the sense of substance, reveals a thing's nature. So imagine that an alien came down to Earth and encountered Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey. And the alien is surely going to wonder what these creatures are. Suppose that someone tells the alien, these are Americans. The alien would learn something true about this couple, but the alien would still not know what they are in the most fundamental sense. He will not have grasped their nature or being. Should this most supremely American couple renounce their citizenship, neither would stop being what each essentially is, a human being. All of us in this room, right, have the same being in this sense. We are human beings. So that means that as bearers of human form or human nature, we're substances or per se unities. And substances are agents. They act. But they act because they possess a kind of internal principle of activity, movement, or rest that persists over time through their own acts. This means that the explanation of what we do and what any substance does has a necessary appeal to nature or form. And this makes us like every other living thing, like dogs and houseplants. If you want to know what's up with some movement of a substance, you have to know the end for the sake of which the movement comes to be. And the ultimate explainer for all of them is that it's trying to attain or exemplify its form. Now, living things have what Thomas calls a natural good, some perfected condition that is the full actualization of their potentiality as the kind of thing that they are. So an acorn is potentially a flourishing oak tree on campus. A puking baby or a screaming toddler is potentially a virtuous adult. The movements of all living things right, are explained in terms of those capacities or powers for certain ends that define and measure the life activities of the living substance. 
So the perfection of a specific power or capacity is always, for St. Thomas, it's complete actualization, right? And it's completely actualized when it attains the end to which it is naturally ordered or tends as the thing that it is. Okay, so back to evil. On this view, evil is a kind of natural defect or lack. Every instance of evil fits the general logical schema of the failure of a substance to realize its full potentiality. So the oak tree might fail to develop strong roots due to lack of rain, exposure to a virus, or some defect within the tree itself. Of such an oak, one could truly say that its condition is bad, defective, lacking, and yes, evil. One can say this because it belongs to the oak, right, the oak form of life, to develop strong roots. This is an essential part of its growth and self-maintenance. We can even say that it's desirable for an oak tree to attain its mature stage of existence or its perfection, because anything short of this is an imperfection or incomplete condition for it. Perfection is just the ontological condition where nothing is lacking that ought to pertain to a thing. So if evil is some lack of the measure of metaphysical perfection, right, then it's a kind of not, right, which implies an ought. There's some sort of normative valence to this. And that means that privation is not simply negation. For instance, the rock is not alive is a true proposition, and the negation of that is that the rock is alive, but that's not a privation because it does not pertain to a rock to live. Contrast this with the very sad claim that Dean Frey is not alive. This is an obvious evil. <clears throat> evil is not an independent reality. That's really the point that I'm trying to underscore here. It's not an independent reality or nature that can be described. It is parasitic on some nature. This is why Aquinas says something that is seemingly paradoxical. He says evil can only be in good. And I hope now that you understand what that means. It means it has no intelligibility on its own. And even evil things are still good for Thomas insofar as they exist. After all, they have an inherent, they have inherent to their form some potential for goodness, even if that potential is not for some reason being realized. Now, this is a thin metaphysical sense of good, but it matters a great deal to Aquinas because of his doctrine of creation and his claim that God is not the cause of evil, right? God creates, God creates good. Okay, so sin. Sin is a special kind of evil. Whereas malum refers to any privation of being, Sin, more specifically, refers to defective acts that result from failures to apply rational rules or principles in a situation, right? So St. Thomas says, sin properly consists in an action done for a certain end and lacking due order to that end, right? So that's that lack of due order, which makes it evil. Now, just as Aquinas has a much wider concept of evil than we do, he also has a wider concept of sin. He distinguishes between sins of making and sins of doing or sins in morality. So the former kind of sin is relative to some narrow sphere of action and concerns making or skills, skilled works, I would call it. But the latter category, of course, is the more familiar category of just failure in human action simpliciter. But Aquinas makes this distinction, right, because he wants to emphasize, and he says this again and again and again. He just says, sin is just a bad human act. That's all that a sin is. And that means that when a chef makes a risotto that is gloppy or overcooks a steak, or when an NBA player misses his shot, these are actually sins in Aquinas' sense. They miss the mark, right? They fail to hit the target at which the actor aims. They mess up. 
But these are not moral sins or sins that imply moral fault or guilt in the Latin. That is culpa, as in mea maxima culpa. Now, in order to miss a target, we have to presuppose some capacity to hit the target, right? A plant or a fish cannot fail to sink the shot. It has no capacity to throw. Aquinas, like Aristotle, wants to distinguish between capacities, right, skills, habits that are skills, and virtues. So think about the NBA player Luke Kennard. He has a capacity to make three-point shots that I don't, although I have made three-point shots before, just for the record. Um, but it was maybe once. It was possibly twice. I can't remember. It was definitely once. But look, my making the shot is basically like good luck. It's not the case that when Luke Kennard makes a three-point shot, it's a matter of luck. The movements of his body are informed by practical principles, right? The appropriate means or techniques of making the shot that govern his hitting the target and ultimately explain it. He's got a kind of practical knowledge of how to make the shot that I lack, right? By contrast, my practical knowledge of basketball fundamentals is tenuous at best, although my speculative knowledge is pretty good. But there is a difference. <laughs> Watching a lot of basketball, sadly, does not make you good at playing it. So possession of a skill is obviously more than speculative knowledge of principles. You have to possess these, right? You, sorry, you can possess speculative knowledge as a long-term observer of the game, as I am, or maybe you've read a book about it. But skill is a habit and it requires habituation and practice and is expressed from the practical point of view of action. It also requires the development of certain bodily dispositions, which is why you can't just watch it and have it. The only way to develop a skill is through constant practice. So the skilled person is guided by practical rules that they have internalized in a really deep way and that perfect their acts, right? They have this kind of habit of the practical intellect that allows them to just see in the moment, right? They don't have to deliberate. They just see in the moment what to do and to exercise their judgments into skilled performances, right? Now, whether the act is good, like whether the basketball act is good, qua basketball act is measured by the performance. Like, did it help you win the game? Then it was good. Sin is faulty action but it's not simply missing the mark because sometimes we can miss the mark, but that's because there was some kind of external interference, right? It wasn't really my fault. Sin is missing the mark due to improper application of the rules that govern the skilled performance itself. And it's really interesting to me. I don't know if people like watch, you know, the pressers after games, but like, for some of these players, it really is like a chance for penance, right? They're just like, I'm so sorry. I didn't live up to expectations, blah, blah, blah. I and mean, they're just going over all their mistakes and they're so sad. And I think the fact that they do this, well, they're forced to do it, but the fact that they do this is sort of a sign that there's something to Aquinas' sense of sin here, right? They know, they know that they have failed and they are they're sort of very publicly taking account of that fact. So a sin has to be attributable to the agent directly. The agent has to be the source of the failure, or it will not count as sin. Now, <clears throat> especially with skill, you can intentionally miss the mark, and it doesn't imply a sin. So, for example, my daughter plays the organ, and now her organ teacher, who is extremely skilled, can intentionally misplay, right, in, or make a mistake in order to show her what not to do, right? This is, not, this is not a sin on his fault. But it's impossible to do this in the moral case. This is something that Aristotle's forever going on about. I couldn't murder someone and then show you all the terrible effects of that in order to really impose upon you the idea that murdering someone is bad. It does not work that way. And Aristotle thinks that this difference will in some way really illuminate the difference between mere skill and virtue. Both are habits, both involve reason, 
but somehow they're very different. Sorry, I forgot to turn off my phone, mea culpa. This is a sin. Uh, this is a sin in some sense, I'm sure. <clears throat> okay. The second sense of missing the mark underscores the fact that skill, the, the sense of habit, is a rational or a two-way power. Here's another example from Aristotle. A doctor can use his medical skill to heal or to harm. A doctor cannot choose whether medicine is for the sake of healing or harming. That is determined by the craft itself, right? Just like, you know, people play basketball to win. But he can exercise this craft here and now on the operating table to heal or to harm. Maybe he's operating on his wife's lover and he wants to kill him. As a doctor, he can do this very skillfully, right? But to do this is to sin in the deeper and more familiar sense, to cheat and lie for pride, right? So to ob obviously to murder on the operating table is a failure to hit the mark, but not as a surgeon per se, maybe he's doing it quite skillfully, um, but simply as, as a human being, right? And it's not possible to intentionally sin in this deeper sense and not be blameworthy. That's supposed to be one of the big differences between moral action and skilled action. Now, obviously, people who are exercising skill, basketball players and chefs, can sin in this deeper sense because they're still engaged in human actions, right? Um, any basketball move it's still a fully human act. And, and of course, basketball players doing basketball moves can sin in the deeper sense as well. I don't know, maybe, um, maybe they're colluding to intentionally throw the game to make money or something like that. And then they're sinning in multiple senses. But the sense that, that really matters, of course, is, is the moral sense. And in order to explain kind of the gravity of the moral sense and the deeper sense of mi missing the mark, we have to go back to this idea of what's the end, right? Because the end is ultimately the measure. Now, the end of every human act, every human voluntary act that involves the will is for Aquinas happiness or a beatitude. This is the measure of every human action as such, it is the ultimate end or the highest good. It is also not surprisingly how Aquinas thinks of human perfection, right? A human who has attained happiness or beatitude is a human who is fully realized or actualized and attained his or her perfection, right? So whereas a skilled basketball player sins qua player, when he fails to produce good works by failing to apply the rules of the game, right? Man sins qua man when he fails at human life by failing to apply the rules of right practical reasoning unqualified. Now, by failing at life, I don't mean that you failed to own a home or get a college degree or have a fabulously beautiful Instagram feed. I mean that you have failed to hit the target or end at which all human act activity is ultimately aimed, that kind of perfect happiness that Aquinas calls beatitude. So to sin in the sense of moral fault or culpa is to knowingly do that which is contrary to the attainment of the goal or purpose of human life. Now, when you see it in that way, right, it's to knowingly choose against your own happiness, sin is obviously a self-defeating, or self-destructing sort of thing. Because it's knowingly choosing things that work against your own perfection or happiness. And it's pretty amazing that we do it because other living things don't do it, <laughs> right? Like, I don't know. I mean, if you just hang around any kind of animal, they just kind of, they do their cat thing or they do their dog thing or their gerbil thing or their horse thing or whatever. Um, they're not actively undermining themselves all the time, though they are undermined in various ways, but they're not, as it were, after their own destruction. This is an interesting human phenomenon. So human happiness is the perfected condition of our human potential. 
More specifically, it is the perfection of our spiritual or rational powers of intellect and will. Now, in order to perfect these powers, right, we need good habits. We need those good habits that Aquinas calls the virtues. Now, Aquinas recognizes four natural virtues and three supernatural virtues, right? So the kind of natural or cardinal virtues are prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude. What are the three theological virtues? Faith, hope, and love. Greatest of these is love, right? Now, cardinal virtues perfect what Aquinas calls the four principal powers of the soul, right? So prudence perfects your intellect. Justice perfects the will. Fortitude perfects, you know, your capacity to fear things. And temperance perfects your capacity to seek bodily pleasures or your sensual desires, These are virtues that you get through good old-fashioned education and habituation and just doing the right thing for the right reason over and over again until it becomes a kind of habit in you or a way of being. Theological virtues are not like that. No amount of hard hard work of, of your own is going to help you because The theological virtues are gifts of God's grace, and what they do is they orient you to beatitude, right? So Aquinas thinks we have kind of a natural end and a supernatural end, and everything natural ultimately gets taken up into the supernatural life of of God's grace, which is why he thinks that charity should be the form of the virtues. And that simply means that even the expressions of justice and temperance and these kind of normal everyday virtues that we're familiar with and that the pagans were familiar with should ultimately be motivated by love of God. That should be the ultimate thing driving you. But really the idea is just that each virtue is going to perfect a power or capacity in you so that all the powers and capacities in you are working for one thing, right? Namely, your perfection. Now, the virtues are related to our reasons for acting, right? So Aquinas thinks that what human beings do can be explained by their ends. But since human beings are rational creatures, they seek their ends in terms of reasons, right? And I think the easiest way to think about reasons is the answers that you give to why questions, right? So like, why are you here? All of you have some reason for being here. Ultimately, those reasons are going to be cashed out and made intelligible in terms of some vision you have about how to live generally. So maybe you're just here for extra credit because all you care about is a grade. Great. Getting good grades is part of your conception of the good life. Maybe you're here because... You really just want to understand, you really just want to understand sin, right? Because you think that this is going to be really important to your living well. Great. That's your reason for being here. My only point is that whatever your reason for being here, maybe your mom forced you to be here. I don't know. And you think that I've got to obey mom, which probably you do. Your reason, right? The thing that explains you are being here, the thing driving you and making it seem good and intelligible for you to be here is going to be made explicit or further intelligible in terms of whatever your conception of the good life or happiness is, right? So you've got some vision of the good life and it makes your choices intelligible and it gives you reasons for acting. A virtue, right, a kind of good habit is a disposition whereby someone is well disposed according to their nature. That's like his general definition. And for us, right, the virtues specifically dispose our capacities so that they are either themselves perfect in their reason or they are disposed to be aligned with reason. So like the passions are not themselves rational powers, but oh, your mom's calling you. Whatever his mom this is, that's adorable. <laughs> anyway, um, okay. <clears throat> yeah. So all the virtues on Aquinas' understanding kind of dispose us to live together well, right? So when Aquinas, I keep talking about happiness, 
something that I want to underscore about Aquinas' conception of happiness is that it's not, it's not like an individual good or a private good. Happiness, uh, especially in the sense of beatitude, is a, is a common good. And really the reason that I stress that is because if you attain happiness, you're thinking of a kind of communion, but it's also something that's just not competitive, right? It's not a finite resource that we have to compete over, but it's also just the case that my pursuit of my happiness, if I'm doing it properly, uh, in no way detracts from your pursuit of your happiness. It's a common good. It would be shared between all of us. Okay. And also, if you have a vision of happiness that has you locked into a zero-sum competition with other people, this is probably a sign that your vision of happiness is false, and you should probably revise it. Okay. Sin is contrary to virtue because it is an inordinate act, although one sin will not destroy virtue, right? So, you know, you're an honest person, um, you typically tell the truth, but you lied the other day because, I don't know, it was a sticky situation and it was just easier to tell somebody what they wanted to hear. This does not destroy honesty in you, right? Virtue can survive a sin, but you have to be careful because if you, if you start easing into lying a lot, right, then you might develop a vice, right? And vice, of course, is the contrary of virtue. Vice is a settled disposition to sin. That is, I think, the best way to, to understand vice. It's a settled disposition to perform bad actions, actions that are contrary to the end that it is your job to attain. So if the cultivation of virtue is coming to be disposed, such as to seek your natural end, then vice is the cultivation of habits that dispose you to a kind of self-enclosure. I think of vice as a kind of selfishness that cuts you off from others and renders you incapable to various degrees of actually loving other people and entering into deep, meaningful relationships with them. So, if sin is to act contrary to our own good, and if we are naturally ordered to our own good, the obvious question is, why do we sin? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Well, one reason why we sin is that we are fallen, right? So Aquinas is a Christian, and thus he has inherited the doctrine of original sin, or the idea that human nature is somehow wounded from the sin of our first parents, and specifically Adam, which has got to be Adam for St. Thomas. Now, Thomas has this idea of original justice, which goes back to God's creation of, of man, right? So when God created us, we had a kind of supernatural strength in paradise. Everything was great. What did that look like? Well, essentially, it boils down to this. The human person's higher powers, the rational powers, were subject to God. The lower powers were subject to the higher powers, right? So your passions were following reason, and your body was subject to the soul. He actually adds a fourth subjection in his commentary on Romans. He says, before the fall, exterior things were subject to humankind, such that they served the human, and the human was not harmed by them, right? So like a mosquito is not going to um, come give you malaria in paradise. So in this prelapsarian condition, perfect rectitude of the will was possible, right? This is the sense in which the gift of original justice perfects human nature, right? It places the basic constituents of our nature in their proper order, given the kind of creature that we are. Uh, but we lost that, right? And so now, what are we like? Like, what is human nature like? Well, St. Thomas says we have a darkened intellect, we have disturbed passions, and a disordered will, right? So the constituents of our nature are no longer properly arranged or aligned. And the darkening of our intellect consists in our finding ourselves in a situation 
where our intellect is no longer subject to God, the lower powers are no longer subject to reason, and the body is no longer subject to the soul, right? So things are kind of messed up. Given all that, we're inclined to sin. Baptism does not fix this, by the way. Aquinas is clear about that. It does some other important things, but it, it does not fix the inclination to sin. Now, in the Summa, Aquinas talks about three causes of sin, three kind of intrinsic causes of sin. So these are causes of sin in you. The three causes of sin are ignorance, there's your darkened intellect, <laughs> weakness of will, there's your disordered passions, and selfishness of the heart or malice of the will. Now, the most serious sins are those done from malice, since ignorance and weakness are factors that make the will's act less voluntary, and we are less culpable, less culpable for our sins to the extent that they are less than fully voluntary, right? So to the extent that they do not involve the fullness of our will. Now, the least voluntary or culpable sins, on the whole, according to Aquinas, are sins from ignorance, right? You obviously cannot hit the target if you don't know what the target is, or you don't know what the rules are that are necessary to hit the target. So, just as ignorance of grammar is a cause of bad speech and writing, so ignorance of the object of practical wisdom, the universal human good, is the cause of bad actions. We have to think that many sins now are probably sins of ignorance, given the current state of our culture and our institutions of education. However, ignorance does not always excuse. Aquinas actually it pains to say this. Aquinas believes that there are things we are apt to know, such as the precepts of the natural law and custom and regular law, and also things that one sort of ought to know. So he says... All are bound to know the articles of faith, the universal principles of right, and the matters of individual duty and state. And if you don't know those things, he thinks you're negligence, and he thinks that that's culpable, because negligence is a kind of defect of practical reason for him, uh, but it basically boils down to the idea that you could have and you should have known, right? And in those cases, when we can say you could have and you should have known, then ignorance does not excuse he says, ignorance of what one is bound to know is a sin. Some ignorance, he says, is invincible in that it cannot be overcome by study. Sometimes he also notes that ignorance can just be directly voluntary, in which case it's absolutely a sin. It could, might even be malice, right? So this is when, like, you don't look into something because you don't want to know. Because if you knew, you'd have to change your behavior and, and you don't want to do that. Probably lots of cases of that. Okay, so that's uh, <laughs> that sense of ignorance. Inordinate passions can be the source of sin, right? So Aquinas understands cases of, of so-called weakness of will as instances where we act contrary to our knowledge, right, on account of some intervening passion. So the problem, problem isn't that you don't know something. The problem is that you're sort of swept away by some kind of passion. So let me say just something really fast about how Thomas understands the passions. So he understands us of having two kinds of appetite. There's rational appetite. That's the will. That's the stuff of choice. And then there's what he calls the sensitive appetite. And he divides that into the irascible and the concupiscible. Um, but you can just think of these as sense desires or sense perceptions that kind of move you in certain ways. So I'll give you an example. So imagine a medicine that smells really foul, like it smells like vomit or something. Obviously, when you smell that, your immediate aversion is to get away from it, right? You don't want to be near it. And it's unthinking, right? You're just going to have this physical aversion to the foul smell. However, you might take the medicine, despite how disgusting it is. Why? Because you know that you're sick and this medicine is what you need to get better and you want to be healthy. Now, the former movement away from the medicine is a matter of the sensitive appetite, right? It's an aversion 
to a terrible smell. And it's mostly a matter of instinct, whereas the choice to take the medicine is a matter of your rational appetite or your will, right? You deliberate that this is the thing to do and you do it no matter how disgusting it is. So those are the two kinds of appetites. Because passions are located in the sensitive appetite, they are notoriously stubborn, right? And difficult to deal with. They are also passive rather than active, right? Like your passions are going to be inflamed by something. They're cognitive because they rely on perceptual judgments, um, but they're also bodily because they're realized through physical changes. So when St. Thomas is talking about the passions, he's talking about shivering and shaking and quickening of pulse and changes in facial color, sweating, a sinking feeling in your gut, heaviness of limbs, etc. Like this is a very embodied sort of thing. On Aquinas' account of the passions, they can distract us from our general knowledge of the good life and lead us to do things that we would not do in a cool, restrained hour. They're not evil, but they can be dangerous, right? As they have to be habituated so as to listen and follow the commands of prudence. Sins of passion are less voluntary. How so? Aquinas argues, or maybe takes it to be obvious, that passions um, can defeat us in two ways. Passions can cloud our judgment, so they can make it so that we just don't see properly in a situation. Um, and then passions can also render our judgments ineffective, right? So like we know, like you're really mad and you know you shouldn't yell, but you yell, right? The problem is not ignorance. <laughs> the problem is the anger. Aquinas often uses the example of St. Peter denying Christ when he explains sins of passion, right? So if you think of Peter denying Christ, a famous scene from the Gospels, his problem wasn't lack of knowledge. It's not like he didn't recognize Jesus. And it's not, it's also not like he didn't know that denying Christ was bad. He knew. Uh, the preponderance of evidence determines that he knew. But what happens to Peter is that he perceives that this angry mob is going to kill him or at least harm him in some significant way. And so he acts to protect himself by denying Christ. Like, I don't know that guy. But as soon as the threat to his life disappears, right, as soon as the mob moves on, he goes outside and weeps. It's important that sins of passion involve this kind of regret. And why do they involve regret? Like once, you know, in a cool hour, you're like, yeah, I shouldn't have yelled at the kids, you know, but I did. The importance of regret is that it shows that these actions are not expressions of our vision of the good life or how we want to be. They're sins, right? Like I shouldn't have yelled at the kids. St. Peter definitely should not have denied Christ. It's really bad. But this just shows the way that passions can impede you, which also which also underscores the need for them to be habituated so that this does not happen to you. Okay, the third category of cause of sin, internal cause of sin, is malice. And this is the worst kind, right? So Aquinas recognizes that we can sin from malice. This is the gravest kind of sin. And Aquinas says it's the root of all sin. By malice, Aquinas does not mean mean-spiritedness or spite. I think that's how we hear it today. And I think that for Aquinas, it's much closer to our legal category of malice. So intent to commit an unlawful act without excuse. That's much closer to what Aquinas means. So for Aquinas, malice is kind of fully intentional wrongdoing. A sin is from malice, if its source is in the will primarily, not in the intellect, not in the passions, in the will, which means that it must spring from an inordinate desire for one's own personal good. A person who sins from malice, not only, so this is what St. Thomas says, not only will we say that the person wills the good that they chiefly will, but also that they will the very deformity that they choose to suffer lest they be deprived of the good they desire. 
So the primary thing that you will is some good, right? But you also will the deformity, right, that you choose to suffer. So you know that it's a sin and you just don't care. So his example is an adulterer. He says, the adulterer wants inordinately the anticipated pleasures of sexual intimacy. That's what they want. And, and that's good. I mean, Thomas doesn't deny that bodily pleasure is good. This is what the adulterer intends in his actions. But he says he also intends secondarily the deformity or defect of sin as the means to this good. Right? So this kind of person, how does Thomas diagnose this kind of person? He says this kind of person loves his own sensual pleasure so much that he is willing to do what he knows is unjust and harmful to the goods of the family and society in order to attain it. Evil is not the object chiefly willed, but evil is fully accepted as a consequence of what is chiefly willed. And again, this is very difficult. This is very different. It's obviously different from the case of sinning from ignorance and passion. What Aquinas is at pains to say is that malice is a deformity of the will itself. And since the will is the root of human action, a sin coming from the will itself is obviously going to be the worst kind. When a person sins in the heat of passion or in ignorance, Aquinas says that he sins while choosing, but not by choice, right? So St. Peter chooses to deny Christ. His choice is spurred on by fear, which causes him to neglect to pay attention to his knowledge that lying and betrayal and apostasy are sins. His choice does not accurately reflect his vision of happiness or the good life. By contrast, the adulterer who sins from malice makes a deliberate choice to commit an injustice for the sake of gratifying his sexual appetites. Such a person has simply decided, right, that his own personal pleasure is more important and valuable. This person knowingly chooses a lesser good, right? Even if he doesn't choose it under the description lesser good, what he does is he knowingly chooses a lesser good. Now, the worst form of malice, kind of sin par excellence, is that which springs from vice. Vice is a settled disposition that inclines the will to acts of sin with ease and pleasure, without regret or compunction, right? The vicious person has a fixed and settled intention to sin. The cultivation of any vice leads its possessor into a settled ignorance about what is truly good. For when a person is disposed to want something inordinately and habitually, his capacity for sound practical judgment becomes impaired. Even though vice makes us unwise, Aquinas locates the error again primarily in the will rather than in the intellect. For example, a greedy man might exploit his workers and deny them a just wage while paying himself exorbitant, exorbitantly, pollute and destroy the environment, cook the books, and so on, all to keep accumulating wealth for himself. Such a person knows that he is unjust. He acts these ways because he thinks great wealth is the central signal of human success. Aquinas argues that such a man sins in ignorance, but not because of ignorance. For it is not just that the vicious person lacks some knowledge. It's that the account of his ignorance can ultimately be traced to disordered desires that direct his attention to the pursuit of lesser goods. And that matters a lot to the diagnosis of the kind of sin for Aquinas. Because the vicious person has a disordered will, Aquinas argues that one who sins out of malice sins most seriously and most dangerously and cannot be recalled from sin as easily as one who sins out of weakness or ignorance. And since the cause of sin is in the will, and again, the will is the capacity for voluntary action, it is the most voluntary of the sins, and so it is without excuse. Aquinas also says that sin tends to lead to more sin. Each time one sins, one becomes more accustomed to it, 
more likely to do it again and less likely to be aware that one is working against one's own good. This factors into what Aquinas says about the so-called seven deadly sins, which he calls the capital sins. So Aquinas understands these sins as the final causes of further sins in us. So capital means head, right? What are they? Pride, envy, sloth, anger, greed, gluttony, and lust. When in the disputed questions on evil, which is actually one of my favorite texts of, of Aquinas, he says greed can cause us to commit fraud, lie, steal, and cheat because the greedy man simply wants more wealth and these are the means to that good. So he says greed has seven daughters. What are the seven daughters of greed? Treachery, fraud, falsehood, perjury, restlessness, violence, and hard-heartedness against mercy. Wrath has six daughters, quarrels, inflated ego, insults, exclamations, indignations, and blasphemies, and so on. Each capital vice is the inordinate pursuit of some real human good or the avoidance of some threat to the good. Pride seeks personal honor and glory. Gluttony seeks the pleasures of the body. Greed seeks the accumulation of external goods. Envy is sadness at the goodness of another when it seems to impact one's own glory, etc. So the vicious sinner isn't like crazy or deeply mysterious, right? This is someone who wants intelligibly good things. He simply wants them in a disordered way, right? So again, he misses the mark, human happiness, because he does not follow the practical principles and rules that govern living well. In short, he acts against nature, against reason, and ultimately against God's eternal law. For Aquinas, those three are intimately related because God, as creator, creates rational creatures in their nature, right, so that they can express and follow God's eternal law. Ultimately, Aquinas follows St. Augustine in thinking that all sin stems from a single source, inordinate self-love. All sin arises because we are intent on some mutable or temporal good. Why would something want what is of lesser value more than what is of greater value? All sin ultimately arises because he loves himself too much. The sinner loves himself too much. So the neglect of love of others, right? Love of others is always going to involve common goods. Common goods are always higher. Aquinas calls this problematic self-love a general covetousness, which is the inordinate desire to possess goods for oneself. He also calls it pride, which is the inordinate desire for one's own excellence. Aquinas distinguishes between these two senses of self-love because he thinks that self-love under the guise of pride, desire for personal excellence, refers to the will for happiness, right, the ultimate good or final end, whereas self-love under the guise of covetousness, this will for the possession of personal goods, refers to the will for the means to the end. Ultimately, they're going to go together because you can't get the ultimate end through without various means to that end. So all sin is self-directed insofar as it springs from taking our own good to consist primarily in our own excellence or glory and the means by which we attain it in terms of hoarding goods for ourselves. This is the primary root of sin. The more proximal causes, ignorance, weakness, and malice, are to be understood in terms of this primary cause, which again is inordinate self-love. Okay, I want to say something about, uh, actually, I'm a little, can I talk about the fall of the devil? Maybe I don't have time for that. We can talk about the fall of the devil in the Q&A. But guess what? It was pride, which is not surprising given everything else I just said. Um, I want to get to the effects of sin. Uh, I think these are important. The first effect of sin actually is a bad conscience. But second, and this is the one that I know you care more about, is a debt of eternal punishment, right? (laughs) Sin occurs a debt of punishment 
through disturbing an order. So long as the disturbance of the order remains, the debt of punishment remains. And we've already talked a lot about disturbance of, of the order. Now, a disturbance of order can be repaired. But if sin destroys the principle of the order whereby man's will is subject to God, the order of charity, it can only be repaired by God, right? You can't really fix that on your own. So whatever sin turns man away from God, so as to destroy charity, is going to incur a debt of of eternal punishment, which only God can take away. And Aquinas sort of just has this idea that because a man fixes his end to sin, he has a will to sin. And this means he has the will to be against God and is not fit for life with God. Not all sins, though, are punished eternally. A sin incurs a debt of eternal punishment insofar as it causes an irreparable disorder, but not all sins do that, right? So a venial sin is repairable. A mortal sin is not. Now, I want to say a little bit of something about the distinction between mortal and venial sin, because I think it reads a little bit different in Aquinas than from what you might hear in Sunday school now. So Aquinas does not want you to think of this as a division of a genus into two separate species, sort of like two kinds of sins, mortal sin, venial sin. He thinks that's a a conceptual mistake. He says, rather, you should think of it in terms of like perfect sin to imperfect sin. So he basically says like a venial sin is not really sin. It's kind of imperfectly sin. Really, sin is mortal sin, right? If you want to think of sin, you're thinking of mortal sin, Venial sin is sort of like imperfectly that. Why is venial sin imperfectly sin? He says because it's not directly against God's eternal law. It doesn't involve being directly fixed on an end that is contrary to the order of charity. Um, So he says it imperfectly expresses the nature of sin, right? So here's a quote. He says, For it is not against the law, since he who sins venially neither does what the law forbids, nor omits what the law prescribes to be done, but he acts besides the law through not observing the mode of reason which the law intends. It's sort of interesting. I never know what to make of this, but St. Thomas's examples of venial sins are always like really lame. It's always like, oh, you laugh too much, or like you said an idle word. And I'm like, wow, I feel like our category of venial sin now is much more expansive than this. Anyway, a mortal sin is often mortal in regards to its object, right? So just the object of the act is something that makes it sinful, blasphemy, perjury, murder, adultery, stuff like this. Aquinas does suggest that sins through ignorance or or weakness are typically venial. Not always venial, but typically venial. What makes the difference for him is that in the case of mortal sin, again, the agent fixes his last end therein or directs the venial sin to something that is a mortal sin in its genus. To sin mortally, you have to know and you have to want the lesser good that you prefer to the attitude, right? You have to know and fix your will. About mortal sin being a grave matter, I mean, Aquinas doesn't really have much to say about that. Like I said, his examples of venial sins, excessive laughter, idle word, seems to me that anything that would consist in acting contrary to eternal law Aquinas most often talks about directly violating a commandment would be mortal sin. So even if you steal a tiny bit, right, you steal a little bit from mom and dad, I think it's still going to be a mortal sin for St. Thomas. Okay, so to sum up, I'm not too far over. To sum up, to sin is to act against nature, reason, and God. It is a word, deed, or action contrary to God's law. Its ultimate source is inordinate self-love or pride. While some sins are worse than others, every mortal sin cuts one off from eternal life with God and incurs a debt of punishment that is eternal. If charity is the form of the virtues, it is what ultimately moves us towards our beatitude. Sin is what destroys charity in us, preventing us from loving God and loving our neighbors as ourselves. So... If what we are after is to know and love God intimately as a friend, then sin, of course, is self-destructive and self-defeating. Thanks for your attention. Thanks for listening to this lecture on the Thomistic Institute podcast. 
The generosity of people like you makes this podcast possible. If you enjoy these talks, please consider showing your support at www.themysticinstitute.org slash donate. Your donation of even a dollar helps us reach more college students and many others with the powerful truths of the faith, and it ensures that we can keep publishing top-notch lectures on this podcast. Thanks a lot.